talk about a topic called interventional audiology. And uh, every time that he asked me about this article, he would call it my manifesto. So it made me feel all like Karl Marx. That's kind of funny. Uh, now one of, the, one of the takeaways from Karl's talk was that we're an older, aging group of professionals. So uh, I thought that you might remember this album. You might have it on vinyl. Uh, 50 million Elvis uh, fans can't be wrong. And I think that's a nice way to lead into the fact that according to some of the data that Amin just showed you, uh, you can relate this to hearing aid, non-use, 26 million uh, hearing impaired people in the United States that don't use our product or services, they can't be wrong either. So uh, just a nice little lead into what I really want to talk about, which is uh, this unmet need. And uh, here's some data just looked at maybe a little bit different way. Uh, when you segment out based on hearing loss, you can see that uh, our profession and our industry uh, does a fairly good job dealing with the, the profound uh, uh, losses. 70% uh, of those are aided and 30% uh, are not. And you could argue that a lot of those are part of the deaf culture and would never wear hearing aids or, or look for our services. And then when you go down a little, one step further, you see the moderate to severe and uh, obviously some opportunity to grow in that segment. And then you see this great unmet need that we all know about uh, with mild to moderate with only 10% of them embracing our uh, services and devices. And so one thing to kind of think about here is maybe we've built a pretty good system for the top two, this quasi-medical channel uh, where they need comprehensive services, they need us to move them through the process, they need expertise and all those kinds of things. Uh, a lot of that predicated on the visit to the audiologist and other medical professionals. Uh, but I think in a lot of ways, we beat our head against the wall for the last several decades trying to do the same thing with that group at the bottom. Uh, that's where, you know, a direct-to-consumer, electro a, a consumer electronic channel is something to think about. Apps, uh, things that are not predicated on the office visit, uh, that are maybe not even dependent on the device. Uh, what are some ways that audiologists as a profession could tap in and address that unmet need? I think that's a really important question. And when people from outside of my, uh, our industry, uh, and a good example of that is that my boss, the president of Unitron in the US, he looks at this data, he's worked at companies all over the world, and he wonders how this is kind of the elephant in the room amongst audiologists. Why are we doing things differently with that uh, channel at the bottom? Uh, I want to call your attention to a famous economist from the Austrian School of Economics, Joseph Schumpeter, kind of shift gears here a little bit from Elvis to Schumpeter, and uh, remind you of a quote, and he's uh, famous for a concept called the creative destruction of businesses and professions. And uh, his famous quote is, all established businesses are standing on ground that is crumbling beneath their feet. And I think that's an important message for anyone that's in business, especially today, because comp uh, competition is getting more fierce, uh, and we really have to be on top of our game in order to stay competitive. And I'll just show you an example. Uh, if you're into whiskey, you might know that barrel makers are still uh, have a livelihood, or coopers as they were known. But in the year 1900, coopers were the third or most popular, third or fourth most popular profession in the United States. And within about 30 years, uh, they practically went out of existence because of them, some things that happened with electricity, automated processes, uh, all those kinds of things. Pretty much drove that profession out of business. And I'm not saying that's going to happen to audiology, but I do think, to, and that's one of the mean students, if I'm not mistaken, uh, with some of these apps and other things, are we at the cusp of creative destruction with an audiology? Uh, that ground is uh, maybe being held together with duct tape, as one of us said earlier today, and we have to do some things a little bit differently. Uh, and I th but I do think there's some real opportunities if we kind of rethink our value proposition as, as professionals to the market. Uh, here's a slide that comes from NIDCD uh, uh, showing the opportunity, and maybe a little bit hard to see in the back, but it shows you the age at which people first notice a hearing loss, and it's uh, a third or so of those people are in their 20s through their 40s. And so one of the big challenges, both for the industry and for the profession, is how do we engage these people that first notice a hearing loss when they're 20, 30, 40 years old? And I think that apps self-guided hearing testing, getting people engaged that way is instrumental uh, in getting those people to recognize that uh, 
They need to pay attention to their hearing. It's important to their, to their lifestyle, to their well-being. Not when they're 70 and 80. I mean, that's a no-brainer, but it's also important when somebody's in their early 20s, 30s, and 40s. And as a society, uh, we don't talk about that much. And just as another example, take uh, someone who's 12 years old, let's say, that has a mild to moderate hearing loss. They have a huge amount of services at their disposal. Uh, but you take that same hearing loss and put it on somebody who's 60 or 70 years old, and that's the person that we laugh at in the grocery store because they don't hear very well or they have the TV turned up. And society in general has a tendency to kind of ignore that mild to moderate hearing loss in older people. Uh, so the bottom line is there is a lot of opportunity just to get people at a younger age to more engage with our services, and we have the technology available to help us with that. But in addition to that, you can look at the medical arena and see the changes there as a huge opportunity for our profession and also for our industry. Uh, just a few months ago, there was a huge two-day symposium in Washington, D.C., and some of you were probably there. Uh, Dr. Frank Lynn at Johns Hopkins was one of the facilitators of that, talking about the fact that age-related hearing loss is a public health crisis. And there's all kinds of data that most of you are probably aware of that relate hearing loss to dementia, uh, to cardiovascular disease, to diabetes, and that's an opportunity for us to really work with other professionals in a multidisciplinary way, way to... Uh, recognize that it's a public health crisis. I think there's also some opportunities in the way healthcare is being delivered through accountable care organizations. Uh, physicians are now being uh, asked to raise the bar on quality and lower costs. And I think there's a real opportunity uh, around preventive care and getting people engaged at that earlier age. And there's also something out there called the uh, quantifiable self movement, which is uh, people have with apps, and the FDA is starting to regulate some of those apps now more carefully, which is a good thing. Uh, but with those apps, you can measure all different types of bodily function, uh, the amount of calories you burn, your heart rate, you, you name it. Uh, why not hearing loss? Uh, why not have people engage in that process earlier? And then the other opportunity, just looking at the demographics, for every one of us in the profession, both uh, audiologists and hearing instrument specialists, there are 12 general practitioners or primary care physicians. So you can see, uh, another huge opportunity to educate that massive amount of professionals that don't really know that much uh, about age-related hearing loss. And I think one way to do that is what I call uh, gaining pillar of community status uh, in your uh, market or in your footprint. And that's really done around three different educating and, and uh, having uh, long-lasting relationships with three different uh, market sec different parts of your community. There's the community in general. That's the opportunity, I think, to put to uh, talk about loop systems and, and make sure people know that those kinds of options are available in a seamless way. Uh, there's opportunities to educate primary care physicians. They're the gatekeepers for some of the reasons I just mentioned. And uh, just patients uh, in general at a younger age, as I've already mentioned. And one of the ways, one of the tactics I would use to do that is something I call the common soil argument. And you'll see more on this, I think, in the next year or so, at least from me, in Carl's hearing review, I hope, uh, is one of the places. But uh, there's a real opportunity to talk about the fact that aging and some of these other uh, chronic medical conditions like diabetes and uh, Alzheimer's at the cellular level share a common etiology or a common soil. And everything is kind of related. Uh, and basically, hearing uh, age-related hearing loss leads not only to uh, a much poorer quality of life, but I would say almost, you could almost say premature death in the sense that people live a very decrepit lifestyle uh, if they don't hear very well. And it's great that we're getting more and more data to support that claim. Uh, I think more good news there. Uh, and then finally, uh, it's sometimes very difficult because physicians are incredibly busy and sometimes they only talk to other physicians. Uh, but I see that changing uh, also. I think especially with younger physicians out of med school, they're trained in a different way. They're trained that our profession is more of a, uh, uh, they call it the pit crew approach versus in the old system, physicians were trained to be kind of the cowboy, the all-knowing expert about everything, and they were resistant to working with non-physicians. Uh, but what I've noticed is that younger physicians especially, because they can't know everything possible, are more likely to uh, want people like audiologists and hearing instrument specialists to be part of their pit crew, to help them raise the bar on quality of care, to help with preventive medicine, and to help lower the overall cost of care. 
And there's some data emerging that says that if you can treat somebody at a younger age, help them hear better, uh, you can lower the overall cost of care as they age. So you're starting, I think, to see this paradigm shift, at least in the way we think about it. I think the real challenge here is how do we, as, as somebody that runs a practice or is trying to uh, make a living, is how do you monetize uh, the delivery of services and, that are not necessarily around the device? So I see this really interesting shift in the way audiologists are thinking about the interconnectedness of the brain and aging and how, and you'll notice hearing aid is not even on this slide, how uh, our services and our ability to provide rehab is instrumental in influencing both the aging process and the way the brain works, uh, even with uh, people that are much younger. So with that, I'm going to turn it over back to Carl.